This is a video about the making of Hextrain. Hextrain is a video game written in 2016 for the Memotech MTX computer. This is a computer that is 30 years old and has a 4 MHz Z80 processor and a TMS 9929A video processor. The game has 192 by 128 15 color 16 frame per second 3D solid graphics, which is clearly impossible with the hardware described. Why is the game hexagonal? Well, by having hexagonal tiles, we avoid having 45 degree angles and track segments of irrational lengths. This means that all the pieces of the track are pretty much guaranteed to fit together with no annoying pieces that don't fit. So what's the big trick? Clearly it's impossible to render 3D video in real time. So instead, render it all in advance and store it to a big disk. This means that all we have to do at runtime is to play it back from that disk. But it also means that we have to render every frame the user could ever see in advance and compile it up into a video sequence. It also implies that we have to have a fast mechanism for reading off of the disk. This implies reading directly from the hardware, bypassing CPM, and reading entire 512 byte sectors without deep blocking. So what I do is I model the train set and I have an Explorer program, which is on the screen now, which is able to show me any view of that, that model that I choose. I can interactively move around, and some of the screens will update to show me reduced views of that data. The black and white view is what I originally thought would be possible based on the amount of data it's possible to update in a VDP each frame. However, with the XE Video compression scheme, I'm able to do the color screen in the bottom of the screen. The ray trace picture is a theoretical ideal output that is possible, but it's not really practical to reduce that into the 15 colors that a VDP will support. So let's have a look around. As well as being able to take the view of the camera that I currently have, I can uh, change the camera to the front of the train. And in fact, the model also knows how the train moves about the track, so I can start the train moving. I can also have it moving faster. And of course, I can observe it from my previous viewpoint. Here we see the train coming round back to the station. Now, being able to render the model from any viewpoint allows me to have a second program, which is the compiler. And the compiler will walk the train through every conceivable path that it could ever travel and produce a compiled version of the video. In writing a game that does video animation on the VDP video processor, the limiting factor is how much data you can write to the screen each frame. And you only have a certain proportion of the time for each frame in order to do the update. So at the end of the active period of a current frame, you get an interrupt or a status bit change here. Then you enter what's called vertical blank. The vertical blank is when the electron gun is drawing the bottom border. Then it's drawing the top border. And then you get to the top left hand corner of the screen and you exit the vertical blank and enter the active area of the screen again. Now in that vertical blank period, you can output a byte of data as the VDP every two microseconds. But now if we're in the active area of the screen again, we can only output a byte every eight microseconds. So we have to go more slowly. So the screen redraws the top one third, and then we get to here. Now if we're still redrawing the active video area, when the electron gun gets to here, you'll see tearing in the active video area. You'll see like a split in the screen where the screen is half the old picture and half the new picture. So the limiting factor is the amount of data you can put out in the vertical blank plus the amount of data you can put out in the top third of the active area. Now it works out that the maximum amount of data you could ever hope to write out to a VDP is about two and a half K. However, with this video area in the bottom two-thirds of the screen, we have about 3K of pattern generator table 
and 3K pattern color table. So clearly it's impossible to update the entire video area. So we don't. We can actually calculate a delta between the previous frame and the current frame and only output the differences. But even that is not efficient enough in order to update the video in a clean and smooth way. So for the last trick the hex train performs, the deltas from one frame to the next in the exit video compression scheme are executable code. They're not data, they're code. Why is that? Well, the reason is that it's more efficient for code to load literal values and then output them to the video chip than it is to read some data from some place and then output them to a video chip. It does mean that the, the exit video deltas themselves are larger to load because they include our opcodes as well as data. But that's fine. We're not optimizing for space. We're optimizing for time. We actually don't care that the delta is larger because we can load the delta of our fast disk storage over multiple frame periods. The only thing that matters is getting that data onto the screen in the time allowed during the video refresh. In addition, as the XC video compressor works through the new frame and its differences to the old frame, it knows what code it's generated. So it knows how many T cycles that, that code has taken to execute so far. So therefore it knows whether it's in the vertical blank period or whether we've now entered the active period on the top third of the screen. So it can generate code to output to the VDP that has no delays and therefore outputs as close as possible to two microseconds as possible or has delays padding to the eight microseconds needed in the active area. It also knows if it's ever exceeded the time allowed and if so it will abort the encoding. That's how I can be 100% sure that all the video updates will take place in the vertical redraw plus the active period. The compiled file, which is about 200 megabytes in size, contains a sequence of paths that are essentially video sequences that are played one after another. In this picture you can imagine the rectangle representing a path whose starting position is position C. So there will be a static frame, a complete uncompressed video frame stored for position C. But there aren't video frames stored for D, E and F. Instead, the arrows, which represent the deltas, are stored instead. So we know how to go from C to D, D to E, and so on. And if we were travelling fast, we would know how to travel from C to E along the double arrow, which is a fast delta. If we were reversing, we could go from E to D, and so on. Now when we get to the end of the sequence in the centre of the screen, we have a choice of where to go next. There are two potential candidate paths that we could take next, depending upon how the points are set on that particular path. We could take the top right path and go to, uh, to G and then onward to H. Alternatively, we could take the path to the other G, because it starts from the same position, and then go on to position K. Now as the next train progresses, it simply walks along a path applying deltas, looking at the points, deciding which path to go to next. The process of following these paths is optimized so that when you load a delta, such as the delta from C to D, the delta itself has information about where to find the delta from D to E, or D back to C, or if there was a double delta from D to F, which there isn't in this example. So the process of loading is fully optimized that in each step of the game, one sequence of 512 byte blocks is loaded and everything needed to do the next set of processing is in that block. So there are two main file formats of interest uh, when you can looking at or debugging this program. So first off there's the file format of the compiled file which contains many uh, headers and many paths, many uncompressed frames and many deltas. And second off, there are saved game files. So let's look at uh, the contents of the compiled file. And to do that, we can use the BE binary editor, which has uh, configuration files which describe the data in the file. So here we see the file has got the header. The header looks like this. We've got a magic number, number of paths, a number of flybys, which are the paths uh, that are shown where you get like a flyover view of the train set, uh, a number of 
blocks holding that information, a number of uncompressed frames, a number of deltas. There are 67,000 deltas, uh, i.e. possible steps the train could make. So each one of the paths has got information about how long it is, whether it's got a station on it, which paths come next, and the, the deltas which start the path are described using the chunks. A chunk is a, a pointer plus a length. So this chunk here, the forward one chunk, takes you to that sector address and it's four blocks long. In addition we have the frames, uncompressed frames, and we have the deltas. So if we look at one of the deltas, what we know is it has four blocks long. The next delta that follows is at this location. Uh, its checksum is this value and it has these following uh, pointers or deltas that can be used after you've applied it. It also knows how much executable code there is in the delta, and this is a, a part of the executable code, how long the executable code will take to run, and here are the raw Z80 opcodes in that delta. So this means we can navigate over all of the data in the compiled file and verify that it does actually make sense. So for example, I could look at all of the deltas, by linking them all together into a big linked list. And I could say, well, actually, there are quite a few of them. And this is a table showing all of the pointers in them. And if I look across to the right-hand side, I can see information about how long they might all take to run and how big they are. All this is possible with the BE editor. Another thing we can do with BE is to debug or at least see the data inside a running program inside Mimu. So if I run text train like this, it will sit there waiting for something to connect to it. Uh, so let's run BE to connect to it. What we now see is that the debugger uh, has popped up. It knows the definitions and the locations of the various variables inside hex train. And in fact, although you can't see it, hex train is running. Here is X-Train, running there. We can look at the variables inside X-Train, and we can see the current game state. At the moment, the current game straight state is uninitialized. But if I go into the game, and I actually start a game, I can look in this uh, record here and I can see the state of the game. I can see the game is being played. I can see the current time, which is 9.01 and 54 seconds, or at least it was the last time I looked. It's 9.04, let's refresh the screen, 9.05. And I can also see things like uh, what configuration all the points are set, how many people are waiting in each position, how many people are on board wanting to go to each station, what fares will be paid when the passengers get to that station, uh, whether they get, in fact the game is played, which path I'm on, which path I've been on previously, how many of them I've been on previously, whether I'm reversing, information like that. I can also see information about the video refresh, I can see the header information that was loaded, the path array that was loaded off of the big file. In fact, I can see any of the internal state of the program. And of course, I can actually change it as the game runs as well. I could, for example, increase my score, although that would be totally unethical for me to do that. Again, this is something that BE can do quite easily. It's much better to do this, to use this technique uh, for debugging a program, than it is to use Mimu's uh, memory viewing windows because this way you can actually decode all of the variables and know what addresses they sit uh, in the address space. Uh, BE has been modified so that it understands the NOI symbol table format that the SDCC toolchain generates. So you can generate a symbol file, you can write a definition of the variables, and you can navigate the internals of the program as it's running. So as just hinted, Xtrain is written using the SDCC toolchain. This is a really quite good C compiler, uh, but includes an assembler as well. So although parts of the logic, shown here, some of the logic for reading silicon disk are written in assembler, most of the logic, especially the game logic, 
is written in C. This particular piece of C on the screen is the C code for playing back a video sequence. And because it's all written in C, it's very high level. And in fact, the whole thing is only two pages in size. It's pretty easy to read as well. So hopefully this has been an interesting insight into how the hex train application was written. We could never have done this back in 1984. We simply didn't know what we were doing. The hardware was nowhere near capable. We didn't have fast disk storage. We never could have rendered the animation. We didn't have the ray traces available. We didn't have the storage to hold the data that was generated. And we certainly didn't know enough about the hardware in how to optimize access to it. So it's no surprise that nowadays a video game can be much better than we originally were able to do. So hopefully, a decent 3D game perhaps for the Memotech computer, unlike some of my earlier efforts. Thank you for listening.